Hello, I'm Dana Reeve. For over a decade, the world of medicine has been a large part of my life. First, because of my husband, Christopher Reeve's spinal cord injury, and now because of my own medical challenges. I've been diagnosed with lung cancer and I'm undergoing treatment. Illness, alas, is a great teacher. And one of the things I've learned is that the process of healing involves both the body and the mind. Your emotional state has a tremendous amount to do with sickness, health, and well-being. For years, my husband and I lived on and because of hope. Hope continues to give me the mental strength to carry on. But also, I'm convinced hope very directly influences my physical health. Doctors know this, of course, but they're wary about how to apply it to the practice of medicine. For many physicians, this kind of thinking sounds new agey and they view it with suspicion. Doctors speak the language of science and quite rightly demand proof that a treatment is effective. It's hard to measure the effect of a feeling like hope on the human body. That is, until very recently. In this program, you're going to meet some very hard-nosed scientists who are doing groundbreaking studies of this mind-body connection. They are proving, in the language of science, that our emotional state, thoughts and feelings, has an enormous influence on physical phenomena like pain, healing, and even our ability to fight off infection. We're calling these programs the new medicine. What's new is an appreciation among medical researchers that we are one complex, interconnected organism, and to heal involves treating the mind, the body, and the spirit. When I was a, a young medical student, I viewed the mind-body connection with great skepticism, and I did as most of my very um, biologically-based colleagues distanced myself as much as possible from notions that stress could make you sick, that believing can make you well. We couldn't understand in scientific terms how something like a thought we don't even know what a thought is. How could that affect something as concrete as health? Talking about bias, but was I biased against this stuff? I didn't believe it. That's just not within my framework of how I used to think about the universe. Listen to their voices as they speak to you. Hear them laughing. As I looked into it, and actually uh, became involved myself in doing some of these techniques. I remember the reaction of some of the clinical chairs at Duke uh, in an email, Snyderman, you've finally gone over the edge. <laughs> Until recently, studying the connection between the mind and the body was viewed with suspicion by scientists. For them, this was the world of spiritualists and quacks. Today, we're beginning to understand the complex biology of how the mind interacts with the body. How something as intangible as hope can help you heal. It says here, the average unmarried female, basically insecure, due to some long frustration, may react with psychosomatic symptoms, difficult to endure, affecting the upper respiratory tract. In other ways, just from waiting around for that plain little band of gold, a patient can develop a cold. There's always been a strong belief in popular thinking that emotions can make you sick. Grandma would tell us that someone was sick with worry and could even die from a broken heart. 
You can feed her all day with the vitamin A and the bromo fizz. But the medicine never gets anywhere near where the trouble is. If she's getting a kind of a name for herself and the name ain't his, a person can develop a core. Well, it turns out grandmother was right, and we now understand why and how things as ephemeral as a thought, as stress, as belief, can actually, on the one hand, make you sick or can help you heal. This link between emotion and disease could be a matter of life and death. Tammy Patton has just been admitted to Duke Medical Center. In the 25th week of her pregnancy, she is facing a crisis. I'll be 26 tomorrow. You think she'll make it to 27? Can never predict. I've seen some miracles happen up here. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I'm looking for one of those. Her water has broken prematurely, and now, unprotected by the fetal membrane, Tammy's unborn child is in great danger of contracting a deadly infection. I mean, how is that for you? You're 24 weeks. Dr. Tracy Gaudet is an obstetrician at Duke. Everything from my chest on down just locked up. Okay. I never even had a clue that my water would be breaking or anything right. like that. No, it, right, when you're like months right. and months away yeah, from your I'm due so date, sure. My fear, I mean, the worst case scenario in this situation is that Tammy does deliver at this point in her pregnancy and the baby doesn't survive or the baby survives but is severely, severely damaged um, and will never live a normal life. Right there. Every day, actually, makes a difference in the chances that this baby has. Okay, the baby's kicking. So, yeah, I'm doing good. You know, we know that stress, especially chronic stress, sitting in the hospital week after week after week, that that negatively impacts the body's immune system. So the last thing we want to do is have a, a weakened immune system when what you're trying to prevent is infection. Yeah, Tammy is receiving the best modern medicine has to offer, including bed rests and a course of antibiotics. Okay, hon. But despite this, almost all women in her situation go into labor within one week. Now, here you are, right? And the plan is that you will be here until this baby is born. So we basically say, okay, you lie here, Tammy, yeah. <laughs> and just relax, right? Do don't worry about anything. All. Don't yeah. get out of bed. Don't walk around. Don't, like, don't yeah. do anything. For Tammy, nothing can be more stressful than lying immobilized in bed, torn away from her daily life, her job, her husband, Eugene, and her 12-year-old son, Mark. This stress can severely compromise her ability to fight off infection. I mean, how have you been coping with that so far? I try to figure out, OK, what am I going to do with Mark? What am I going to do with my house? What am I going to do with my job? What am I going to do with everybody, you know, that depends on me at this point in time? You know, we know that there is a very significant relationship between the level of someone's stress and the onset of labor. That's been well documented. And yet, bizarrely, we have never looked at stress reduction as an intervention. It just seems like a no-brainer. OK, so I'll walk okay. you through it. Okay. If you want to close your eyes, it's easier that way. You breathe in first through your nose. One, two, three, four. Good. Hold it. Tammy is about to receive a new, and for Western medicine, a revolutionary form of therapy. And then hold the breath. Dr. Godet will teach her stress reduction techniques to delay the onset of labor and also to boost her immune system. We now understand that there's a complex biochemical link between stress, the immune system, and illness. When we're stressed, the brain causes the release of chemicals which go through the bloodstream and activate the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands, in turn, give the body a shot of some very potent hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. 
Both give us a boost of energy, highly useful for survival. But when the stress is continuous and unremitting, cortisol continues to be released into the bloodstream. One of the side effects of cortisol is to suppress the activity of our immune system, leaving us vulnerable to infection and disease. Lower the stress, and you lower the risk of infection. For Tammy, every day that she avoids infection and premature labor increases her baby's chances for survival. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. It's just kind of like this nice little thing. <laughs> the beauty of some of what we're going to do is around visualization, is that your body will actually respond to what's in your mind. Right. Like if you've ever been on vacation, you've been in a great situation, but your mind is actually going over the stressors, your body would be stressed and tense. Yeah. And so this is the opposite. This is like, okay, you're in a stressful situation, but we can help your mind take a little vacation and, oh, and be, be nice. someplace else. Yeah. And the great thing about it is that both your mind gets the benefit as if you actually were someplace else, and your body does too. Like if we were monitoring your blood pressure and your heart rate and different stress markers, when we do the visualization, the body responds just as if it were there. My hope is that she, that those tools and those approaches help her stay centered, stay sane, and that they will actually help her physiologically. Is let an image come to mind a place where you feel completely at ease, happy to be there. It'll help her immune system to function better. It'll help her stress response to stay at a low point so her stress hormones are not coursing through her veins and, you know, getting her ready to go into labor. It's warm, but it's cool breeze. Ah, oh, that's great. Do you hear any sounds in this place? No, it's just fairly quiet. Oh, there's a balcony. Okay, balcony. There's a TV. Okay. Tammy is one of the very few women in a high-risk pregnancy situation getting a course of stress reduction. Modern medical culture focuses on drugs and surgery. Most doctors don't see these mind-body interventions as part of the practice of real medicine. It wasn't always so. From the time of the ancient Greeks, pre-scientific medicine made a direct connection between our emotions and our physical health. This all began to change during the Renaissance, when people started to dissect cadavers and see the physical effect of disease on the organs of the body. In that period, it came to be understood that disease was associated with abnormalities of anatomy. If you died from a pneumonia and you opened up the lungs of the person who died, you saw that there were holes and there was pus and there was all sorts of abnormalities of anatomy. Emotions and their effects on the body mystified medical researchers. Because you couldn't see it. If you can't see it, it isn't real. If you can't understand how it works, it isn't real. That was the assumption. Researchers didn't have the tools to see the biological connection of emotions to physical illness. Emotions were relegated to a different specialty. By the 20th century, the split between mind and body was complete and became an article of medical orthodoxy. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. In the last few decades, we've developed sophisticated tools to actually see the physical changes in the body caused by the mind. Ironically, modern experimental discoveries have led us back to the ancient idea that emotions are inextricably linked to our physical health. There are so many clues that the mind has an effect on the body at all distant sites. Nerves link the mind to the heart, the immune system, the digestive tract, and directly or indirectly to every cell in the body. 
And with neuroimaging, with brain imaging, with molecular biology, cell biology, physiology, we can put all the pieces of the puzzle together, which we certainly couldn't do even just a few decades ago. We can understand through the language of science that emotions and disease are connected. And disturbances of emotions can change your physical health, and physical disease can change your emotional health. Today, the federal government, through the National Institutes of Health, is giving substantial support to mind-body research. Hey, Glazer. The husband and wife team of Janice Keycolt Glazer and Ronald Glazer has performed a series of experiments dramatically demonstrating the effect of emotions on our health. Their groundbreaking work, funded by the NIH, is on wound healing. Oliver Wendell Holmes in the 1860s, he'd observed that wounds for soldiers who had been victorious were much more likely to survive certain kinds of wounds than those who'd been beaten. It was a, a wonderful example of just how powerful stress and wound healing can be. Yeah, I'm just gonna feel like a little pressure here. In one of the Glazer's experiments, small wounds are deliberately given to two sets of volunteers. One group is family caregivers of Alzheimer's patients. These are people who are under constant and enormous stress. The other group, matched in age and financial circumstances, has measurably lower levels of stress. We have the caregivers, and we have very well matched control people who are at the same age and so on, but who aren't caregiving. That's the design of the study. The nurse takes a little instrument that creates a, a little wound about uh, smaller than the size of a pencil eraser, a standardized small wound about an eighth of an inch thick. And then what we did was we photographed the wound over time so we could watch the shrinkage of the wound and compare that to a standardized dot and get a sense for exactly how fast the wound was shrinking. The results of these and similar experiments are remarkable. On the average, the wounds of the unstressed group healed a full nine days sooner than the highly stressed group. It was a huge difference. The hormones released when we're stressed interfere with the complex biochemistry of healing. How quickly we heal is affected by our state of mind, particularly our level of stress. Today, Michael Gulen is facing major surgery. I have a degenerative disc disease in my bottom two discs, and I've had back problems for like 15 years. They're replacing the uh, two bottom lumbar discs. The small wounds which the glazers create in their experiments heal much faster under lower stress. Studies suggest that the same is true for the large wounds we receive when undergoing major surgery. I'm really hopeful that this is gonna change my life and so let's hope. For the last week, Michael has been preparing himself for this operation. Preparing his mind. A patient is wheeled in and you look over surprised but not surprised to see that it is you. You watch as the team surrounding you works over you. And perhaps they even express surprise at how well things are going, at how easy it is to do what's needed. I, I guess they're trying to get in your subconscious that the surgery is being done by people who are you know, who are knowledgeable and there's nothing to worry about, essentially. It's reassurance also. And you can see with a kind of detached interest that this is an operating room and that busy, capable staff people are preparing it for someone. A team of competent, trustworthy collaborators readying the equipment I actually listened to this this morning at like 5.30 in the morning. 
And it definitely helps you, relax you. She says, you know, think of yourself as being in a peaceful, safe and secure place where you're happy. <laughs> think of a happy place. Exactly. You know. First time I listened to that, I had to actually pause it and think hard. The CD was supplied to Michael free of charge from a surprising source, his insurance company, Blue Shield of California. When I first heard about guided imagery, I was intrigued by the studies that I had looked at, some preliminary studies. It, but then again, I've had the scientific training, so it was like, show me the proof. Blue Shield conducted a trial that produced remarkable results, significantly shorter hospital stays and lower medication expenses for the patients who practiced guided imagery before surgery. For the price of a $17 CD, the company saved, on the average, $2,000 per surgery. The benefits were startling to us from a financial perspective. In spite of some initial doubts that this is a little bit flaky, a little bit too California for some people, it didn't turn out to be that way at all. How are you? Okay. Good. Wiggling your feet? Good. Sometimes it works. <laughs> when studies like this get communicated, it changes the way people view how they practice medicine or from a member point of view, what they should expect from how medicine is practiced. <laughs> Tammy Patton has been in the hospital for 17 days. She's been practicing her relaxation techniques. She shows no signs of infection. Wow. He got his hands against his face. I know. He just looks like he has a strong personality. He'll do exactly what he wanted to do. <laughs> These 17 days have given her baby a much better chance for survival. If we could get the same results with a pill or a medicine that we could put in an IV bag as we could with many of these mind-body approaches, it would be mainstreamed in a heartbeat. But it's because, in part, it lies outside of our paradigm of what we think medicine is and what we think is powerful that it's taken a very, it's a much more difficult thing to integrate. It is crazy. This is the right corner artery. Every single patient should be informed that the mind has a huge impact on the body, and here are ways that you can take advantage of that. But it's not. we got a long way to go. Treating the mind and the body as separate entities is deeply ingrained in our culture. And this is one of the things that drives me crazy, OK? Kid has abdominal pain. They go to the gastroenterologist, they get scoped, they get blood tests, they get everything under the sun. We can't find anything, therefore, you're a head case, right? In his rounds with hospital residents, Dr. Gary Walco, a specialist in pediatric pain, drives home the message that there is no mind-body split. What we want to get away from is dichotomizing. And if you get nothing out of your experience with me this month, nothing other than the following statement, I'll be happy. If you dichotomize pain as being either physiological or psychological, you're dumb. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Questions, comments? Come on. <laughs> Dealing with chronic pain is a major problem in medicine today. Yes. Are these the spots where you get, tend to get sore? Yeah. Billions of dollars are spent trying to treat it by conventional means, no, it hurts. often ineffectively. Which of these words describe your pain? Stinging? No. Fearful? Yes. Sharp? This is where mind-body techniques are showing Sorry. impressive results. Horrible? Yes. Is there ever a time it's not there? No. Okay. 
So I underline always three times there. No breaks. Okay. For months, 13-year-old Helene has been suffering from constant, often excruciating pain. She started out with headaches, her bone aches, and over overwhelming fatigue. Missing school and competitive sports, she spends her days at home alone. Dr. Walco sees many young patients with these symptoms, unexplained bone aches and chills. He suspects Helene's pain developed from symptoms that continued after she had recovered from a mild flu-like illness. All right, so now let's go back and listen to what you've told me about you. Extremely often, pain is preceded by some low-grade illness, and that goes away, and then a few weeks later is when the pain begins. These pain signals, nerves firing in the body and the brain, do not go away. But for reasons that nobody understands, they intensify over time. Walco's treatment goal is to turn off those pain messages. And we teach kids specific strategies to help them affect their pain and change their pain. We work really hard with you to get back to your normal lifestyle. Now what you're gonna say to me is, well, that's fine, I'm willing to do that, I'm just in too much pain, right? Well, what's stopping you from playing field hockey right now? Okay. What's stopping you from playing soccer? My pain. So as soon as the pain goes away... I'll play. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Potter is an 18-year-old high school student with cerebral palsy, which affects coordination and muscle tone. Oh, great. Of course. Oh, this looks familiar. So you get to see me driving skills in action. Matthew can look forward to a long life, but until now, it has been a life filled with constant and on occasion, terrible pain. We're gonna build a fun image. So give me an image of something that you like to do that you find relaxing, pleasant, the opposite of pain. Mm. Playing video games with a bunch of my friends. Just the whole big, you know, everybody's around laughing and, you know, just having a great time and just moving it up. Okay. What we're going to do is a, a couple things. In a typical one hour session, Walco first relaxes his patients and then puts them into a hypnotic state. Completely. Now listen very, very carefully. You're at home and you're with your friends, and there's a whole group hanging out to play some Xbox. And the specific game is gonna be Halo 2. Take a moment and focus on the screen on the TV. I see that we're checking everybody's score to see who's in the lead. Listen to their voices as they speak to you. Hear them laughing and carrying on. And knowing you and your friends, I'm sure there's a fair amount of ribbing that's going on and people yeah. sort of making fun of each other. All the time. Good. And of course, since this is your image, you're totally in the lead, leaving the other guys in the dust. And you might even notice some of the scents, the smells in the room. And notice how good it feels to be immersed in such a pleasant, pleasant situation. Early on in my career, I worked mostly with kids with cancer who were undergoing invasive procedures like uh, lumbar puncture spinal taps. Kids were pretty traumatized. Oh, great. Yeah. We'll have to stay really still, and then it'll be all I'm going to hold you quite so tightly, okay? So they used to take uh, five or six people to do a procedure, and it was one to do the procedure, one to assist, and four people to hold the child down. So it was kind of gruesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we started to look for alternatives. Like, are there ways that you can really work with kids to make that more bearable? 
<laughs> Dr. Wolko started teaching his patients self-hypnosis techniques to tune down their pain. And lo and behold, we found that there was a group of kids who could literally use hypnosis and go through the experience without a lot of distress at all. All pain, no matter what its source, is experienced in the mind and can be modulated by the mind. We see this happening all the time in the world of sports. In the heat of the game, athletes often seem completely oblivious to pain. Here we see Donovan McNabb playing the entire second half of a football game so focused on winning that he isn't aware that he's just broken his ankle. Hypnosis is a technique that harnesses this ability of the mind to focus intensely. Take a nice deep breath through your nose. Notice how it feels when the cool, dry air goes into your lungs. Just focus as you breathe in and out, in and out. Matt, are you in any pain or discomfort right now? Some, but not nearly as much as when we started. Let's see if we can reduce it even more. And nerves are basically like electric wires. They carry impulses, they carry messages. And right where those nerves connect, I want you to see very clearly that there's a switch. In fact, it's a dimmer switch. What I'd like you to do is turn the dimmer switch down so that less of that pain message is getting through to your spinal cord. All of the tension goes out. Five, four, three, two, one. Wow. Details, please. The that's, exclamation's fine. That's something. Uh, it definitely worked. I, I mean, I was aware of, you know, everything that was going on, but it was, it was so, it was kind of hazy, and I was more focusing on my body. And then, as soon as I really started that dimmer switch, I could actually feel less and less of a reaction from those nerves and those muscles. Outstanding. Unbelievable. So you got to know that all we did today was the basics. Wow. All pain is physical and psychological. That's the nature of pain. We can see this in the brain's reaction to a pain stimulus. One center localizes it, but another center, the emotional center, is just as important. It tells us how distressing the pain is, which motivates us to take action. Patients suffering from chronic pain experience great frustration because they can do nothing to control it. Their mental distress makes the physical pain worse. Small things, you can't turn the doorknob. I can't open a cap in a soda bottle. You can't lift a fork. The University of Maryland's Kernan Hospital organizes weekly sessions with a group of outpatients suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. You hit all the fear. Am I gonna be, you know, a senior citizen that just can't move? Do I have to have somebody to take care of me all the time? I had a, uh, a two-year-old, I couldn't pick him up. 
I am a mom. I am supposed to be able to pick up my son. And it was very difficult for me because I had to come to, to terms with a different idea. And that's, that's it. That's, that's the change for me. It was a big one. To help manage their rheumatoid arthritis, these patients are taking powerful medications. But equally important are the skills they're learning here to control the emotional component of the pain. I'm going to lead you on a short meditation. The group practices mindfulness meditation, focusing on their breathing and therefore on the here and now. This technique will lessen the fear and anxiety associated with their pain. If somebody has a particular problem like a chronic pain, chronic back pain, let's say, um, instead of uh, just re reacting to that pain, like, you know, they wake up and there's the pain and just saying, oh, it's going to be another terrible day and it's always like this, and it triggers a whole set of uh, thoughts in that person and emotions. If they have learned some of the mindfulness meditation approaches, it gives them a chance to take a step back, to actually reflect for a moment, and not just to react, but to choose their pattern of reacting. Eventually you realize that your, the pain is one thing from the physical problem, but it's the emotions and the, uh, the mental suffering that you actually can have some control over. It's really not worth it to spend so much energy worrying about the future or lamenting the past, it's because it really makes things worse. Well, that's the whole idea of breathing, isn't it? I mean, when you concentrate on your breathing, your breathing is right now. You can't concentrate on your past breath or your future breath. When you breathe, it's your right now. And that's, what, that's why mindfulness brings you to your now, to your awareness of your present moment. I'm just now, I'm here with you. It's been very powerful for me. It's hard to put into words. It's been really hugely powerful for me. Doctors in major medical centers, one in five across the country, including Harvard, Duke, and the Mayo Clinic, have begun integrating these techniques with more conventional medical care. In the next in-breath, we'll be raising up. There are many different ways of harnessing the power of the mind to heal the body. Meditation, yoga, exercise, prayer. Meditation may relax me, but may do nothing for you. You may prefer to read a book or lie on the beach. No one way works for all people and no one way works for any one individual at all times in our life. You think that at the beginning, that your first couple of weeks, that, you know, okay, we're going by pretty quick and this is gonna happen. But the third week. Three weeks in the hospital and Tammy Patton is having a difficult time. You can watch all the TV in the world. There's nothing really that interesting on it. We don't have any visitors. Everybody in the real world is working. I can't help my husband. And he's working overtime because I'm no longer working. And he has to pay the bills, take care of Mark, then come and see me to make sure I don't get crazy up here. And so there's a lot of stress on him as well. And you're just stuck in this one place, in this bed, all day long. It seems like the room just gets smaller and smaller. It's completely expected for her to hit a low point. The rough spots come. It's not like if you do this all right, you won't have a rough spot. Just let an image come to mind. Any place you'd like it to be. I think there's a tendency to think that, oh, it's really in the technology and this other stuff is just touchy-feely and, you know, just to kind of appease people. It's where we're very wrong. And as we understand, I think, the science behind a lot of these approaches, including mind-body approaches, then we will really begin to understand that they are every bit as powerful as the technology that we've come to rely on and trust in. Just take your time, it's a big shift. Mm -hmm.
At the Keck Laboratory at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Richard Davidson has sophisticated tools to actually look inside people's brains as they experience different emotions. So today's experiment focuses on regulating your emotions. You'll be watching pictures on a computer monitor to elicit either negative emotions like fear, sadness, and disgust, or pictures that elicit very little emotion at all. Does that make sense? Davidson has studied the brain responses of a large number of subjects with a variety of temperaments. Okay. <laughs> okay. The general idea is that people differ quite dramatically uh, in how they respond to life slings and arrows. Some people are very vulnerable uh, in response to life stresses. They show a very big and prolonged response. And other people are much more resilient. We have been very interested in understanding what the brain mechanisms are that are associated with those differences. And most importantly, how we can change people to make their emotional styles more resilient, more beneficial, more positive. In our culture, we have not given the training of the mind, and particularly training emotion, sufficient credence. We have not really put it to the test. Imagine if someone spent as much time training their mind, particularly training emotion, as a person whose avocation was golf spent on the golf course. We know that when we practice on a regular basis, uh, our skills can be improved. Buddhist monks spend their lives training their minds. This rigorous discipline can produce dramatic results. Using only the power of thought, this group of monks is able to significantly raise their body temperatures and steam dry freezing cold towels with their body heat. They do this during an advanced type of meditation called Tomo Yoga, an amazing physiological change in the body produced entirely by the mind. These individuals one can think of as kind of the Olympic athletes of mind training. Barry Curzon is an ordained Buddhist monk, an American. He's lived in India for almost 20 years. <laughs> Several monks, with the support of the Dalai Lama, have agreed to take part in these experiments, studying emotions and the brain. Every one of the participants in this research study that we're doing has spent a minimum of 10,000 hours training their mind. And by studying this group of experts, we can see the most extreme kind of changes in the brain that may be produced through this kind of mental training. Mary, can you start focus attention meditation? Meditation is a word which would be akin to sports. There are lots of different kinds of sports. There are lots of different kinds of meditation. Can you start to meditate on compassion now? Davidson can actually measure changes in a monk's brain as he focuses his mind on specific emotions. Neutral states. Davidson uses both the EEG, which detects electrical patterns in the brain, and the functional MRI, which pinpoints which areas of the brain are active. Okay, Barry, we're going to start the first meditation on compassion. Okay. This kind of meditation and other similar meditations are really methods to uh, train the regulation of emotion. First scan real short, just 10 seconds, just hold real nice and still. With his understanding of the effect of meditation on the brain, Davidson set out to apply his findings to the general population. In one trial, he used two matched groups of volunteers. Only one group was trained to meditate. After two months, he gave both groups a flu vaccine. He hypothesized 
that meditation would strengthen the immune system, an effect he could determine by measuring the number of antibodies in the different blood samples. On the basis of really a meager amount of meditation training, there was a demonstrable effect on the body. But what was particularly interesting is that those individuals in the meditation group who showed the biggest change in their brain were also the people that showed the biggest change in their immune system. They showed the biggest response to the flu shot. Uh, and so they appeared to be closely associated, uh, suggesting that uh, the meditation was producing a kind of coherent set of changes in both the brain as well as the body. The core hypothesis is that things like positive attitude or positive emotions should not be regarded as, as traits which are immutable, which cannot be changed. Happiness and other beneficial qualities of the mind and the body should be regarded as skills. This is extremely important for the public to know about because it is directly supported by modern understandings of the brain. In the science of mind-body research, this is a new frontier. Is there a way of saying what you get out of meditation? What? <laughs> Tears of joy, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, I mean, sometimes it's really hard work. It doesn't go well, of course. Uh, sometimes it's ecstatic. The kind of joy that comes sometimes from meditation is different than anything else that I've experienced in my life. And what comes up kind of with that automatically, and I feel it now, is tremendous gratitude for my teacher and teachers. And, and a wish. that others could have the same experience. Matthew Potter is on his way to another session with Dr. Walco. This is looking suspiciously like the start to a driver's ed thing. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I gotta concentrate. That's why I'm not too eager to take driving lessons, because I don't want to deal with traffic. Well, I'm going out there. All right, go, 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 go. You've been driving since you were five. Yeah, without 50,000 other wheelchairs in the way. Matthew has practiced hypnosis techniques every day for the last week, and is now able to considerably lower his pain. Clearly, the strategy that you did get into last time was the dimmer switch, correct? Dimmer switch is good. That works. I like okay. the dimmer switch. Yes. Now here comes the ultimate test. Matt, ready? All the way down. Totally relaxed. In this session, Dr. Wolko has taught Matthew how to go into a hypnotic state instantly. Now, Matt, stay in the state that you're in, but I need to ask you something. Are you able to snap your own fingers? No. OK. OK, it's not a problem. Five, four, three, two, one. Gotcha. Yes, yes. All right. Um, we need to give you some specific strategy that will work as quickly for you as my finger snap. I've got options. We can use your own fingers. Matt's the kind of kid who wants to be able to master this. He really wants to be able to control more of what's going on with his own body and be able to go through transitions through the course of his day in a way that is less disruptive to him. Like just have them together, move them apart, and that's going to be your trigger? Matthew will learn to enter the hypnotic state on his own. The sense I have is that he wants to master his pain. He doesn't want it to master him. OK, pal. Index fingers together. Look down at your fingers. Take them apart. Outstanding. Deeper. T 
people often will think, if I just do enough imagery long enough and hard enough, or enough meditation, I'll never get sick, or I'll cure my cancer, or, I mean, that's not the goal. I mean, the goal is to, to create the optimal situation so your body can do what it can do in conjunction with the medicine. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. This is kicking. Right, Tammy has just developed an infection. She's avoided this complication for four weeks, far longer than the average woman in her high-risk situation. She must have her baby delivered immediately by C-section. The baby will be premature, but now has an excellent chance of being healthy. Physicians really need to understand that the patient's state of mind is going to be very, very important. What is going on in that individual's brain influences the outcome. The data is there. And it's certainly key to the appropriate practice of medicine. So knowing that the mind and the body are connected at many, many levels helps us physicians treat people, treat patients differently. We'll say, yeah, well, you know, I can see how an emotion can affect health. Therefore, let's incorporate this into the way we take care of patients. Okay. <sighs> Are you okay? Oh, yeah. You just have to breathe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just breathe. Can I stay a lot of falls? Maybe. I know, but just breathe. You have a little bit of heaviness here on your chest? Uh-uh. Okay. No. Sometimes that's normal. Okay. Oh. Oh. Tammy, that's your baby being born. Oh. Aww, the bottom half of him is beautiful. You see him? <laughs> you see him? Oh, God, is he okay? Oh. Yeah. He's looking all around. Oh. 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 Congratulations. <laughs> Science can inform a tremendous amount of, of what we do in medicine, but I guess it can't, it can never explain it all. You know, we can never understand the mystery of the human being, the human body, the human soul, the way those two interface. It's not predictable. It's a miracle. I know. And for me, that's part of the beauty of it and part of the, the joy of being a physician is to be in partnership with that mystery, be in partnership with a human being, not just trying to fight the disease. Uh, you know, six what do you want to name? What do he look Julian like? Julian Eugene. Julian, are you sure? I'm positive. The whole person will always be a mystery and will always require the art of medicine, not just the science. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, thank you. Baby looks good. He, he does? Out crying, yep. Is he breathing? He oh, is. He's breathing okay. on his own right oh, now. Oh, God. God. Soon, Matthew will be leaving home and going to college. He's learned to control his pain so that the pain no longer controls his life. Michael Gulen healed rapidly after his surgery, but is still on the long road to recovery. Helene has succeeded in mastering her pain and is now back in school full time. Even with the best therapies, some people may never be completely cured. But they and we have the ability to discover and strengthen a resilience within using the extraordinary power of the mind. Life as we know it has now changed. Ladies and gentlemen, the graduating class of Ridgewood High.